He's devoted much of his life to diplomacy. Ban Ki-moon joined South Korea's Foreign Service in 1970, and since then he's worked and traveled the world. Ban began his successful diplomatic career in New Delhi before ending up in multiple posts from Seoul to Washington to Vienna. In 2004, Ban Ki-moon served as South Korea's Foreign Minister until 2006, when he declared his candidacy to replace Kofi Annan as the head of the United Nations. The General Assembly elected him as the 8th Secretary General in October that year, beginning his term in January 2007. The challenges he faced were many, from Iran and North Korea's nuclear programs to conflicts in the Middle East and the threat of global warming. Some of the main objectives the UN achieved during Ban's tenure include setting up the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Climate Change Agreement and the creation of UN Women, an entity working for women's empowerment. After two terms, Ban left office and was replaced by Antonio Guterres in 2017, but many of the issues he faced still remain. So what can the United Nations do to have a bigger impact and affect global change? In his new book, Resolved United Nations in a Divided World, Ban reflects on the role of his former organization in today's multifaceted society facing many challenges. The former Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, talks to Al Jazeera. Ban Ki-moon, former Secretary General of the United Nations, now the Deputy Chair of the Elders. Thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. You have a new book out. We'll come to that uh, in a moment. But first, let me take you back to the end of your decade as the Secretary General of the UN. You were Secretary General right up until the end of 2016. Some people might say you dodged a bit of a bullet by the date of your departure because your successor, Antonio Guterres, uh, took office on the 1st of January. He only had 20 days before another important world leader took office, the leader of the most powerful economy on earth, and that was Donald J. Trump. He was someone who didn't really agree much with international cooperation. Some might say uh, he didn't agree with the UN system. Are you relieved you didn't have to deal with President Trump? In that regard, personally speaking, I was relieved because I, I was not uh, supposed to deal with him. But what had happened during President Trump's four years' time, as a former Secretary General, I was uh, deeply concerned about the multilateralism in disarray. The most of the important um, international agreement have been cancelled during his time. Uh, first of all, climate change agreement, uh, which took almost 20 years uh, since, um, longer than 20 years since Kyoto Protocol, has, has been almost um, ruined by the withdrawal of the United States and the U.S. also withdrew from JCPOA, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, uh, to deal with Iranian nuclear issues. And there were a lot of uh, such multilateralism which have been in disarray. I am very much relieved and happy that uh, Joe Biden has been elected and returned to Paris Climate Change Agreement and now um, U.S. is uh, serious in negotiating with the Iranians uh, for returning to JCPOA. And all, there are also many other areas in world trade systems which have been also hampered by the lack of the spirit of multilateralism. Do you think there's lasting damage from the Trump era? And did you ever fear that perhaps he might pull out of the U.N. completely and that could affect the whole future of the United Nations? I didn't think that they would dare to consider withdrawing from the United Nations itself. But it is true that I have been very much concerned. Then, as a former Secretary General, I was invited to many international forums, international conferences, small and big. Each time, I have been speaking out that uh, President Trump's uh, vision was uh, politically very short-sighted, 
and morally wrong. When it comes to climate change, it, he was scientifically very much wrong and uh, economically also irresponsible. And I, I told and warned the world that he may be standing in the wrong side of the history. I can tell you that I have done my utmost efforts and I've been working tirelessly with the world leaders so that the world leaders can demonstrate their global citizenship, their leadership based on global citizenship. And at this time, I do not see many leaders, global leaders, who really act genuinely as a global leaders based on global citizenship. You say in your new memoir, populist bullies are perhaps the least effective diplomats. I suspect that might be a reference to President Trump. Let's look at one example, somewhere you know so well, because you were a veteran South Korean diplomat, rising to be the foreign minister before you became Secretary General. I want to ask you about recent developments on the Korean Peninsula during the Trump era. There were three face-to-face -face meetings between President Trump and Kim Jong-un. Very unusual diplomacy took place. Is the world a safer place? Of course, he was the first United States president who met North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. And also, he was the first United States president who had stepped on the territory of North Korea, even though it was very brief. In that regard, there was most heightened expectation that U.S. president would be able to agree on a very concrete agreement with North Koreans to make um, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Particularly when I, I'm saying that uh, about North Korea, North Korea is the only country, first and the only country in 21st century who have tested six times nuclear bombs. And they have also tested the, intercontinental ballistic missiles, long range and short range, and they are also um, developing a submarine based uh, nuclear weapons, etc. Therefore, we had uh, much, much expectation. But in the end, his um, sort of uh, reality show type uh, diplomacy has made a uh, lot of Koreans and the people of uh, peace loving people very much disappointed. Now, the current situation on the Korean Peninsula is also very much worrisome. We have to make sure that um, during President Biden's era, that, that there should be a complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. North Korea is a place with an appalling human rights record. When you were Secretary General, you used to talk a lot about human rights up front but it's pretty clear that human rights abuses are growing around the world and some of the most powerful countries on earth are involved. I give you two examples. For example, the Uyghur people in China, a permanent member of the Security Council, responsible for what some say is genocide, and Syria, where human rights groups all agree that Russia has joined the Assad regime uh, in abuses, including targeting medical facilities. You were Secretary General. How hard is it for a Secretary General to confront these sort of problems when they're carried out by the most powerful countries? There are, of course, uh, abuses of human rights, violators in, in this world. Now, because of the divisions, divisions among big powers, particularly the permanent members of the Security Council, Big Five, then nothing could have been agreed upon to deal with the human rights. For example, on, in the case of Syria, 6.6 .6 million Syrians are now have become refugees here and there in Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, and Egypt, and elsewhere. I have visited all these places, but Security Council has not been able to agree on anything, even on purely, genuinely humanitarian issues because of the veto power. Then. I think who should be blamed on this um, is only the people. Then I have been speaking out that the justice will prevail 
for those perpetrators of violators of human rights and justice, then I've been speaking out that justice will prevail, if not today, tomorrow. If not tomorrow, surely in the near future. That is what the uh, International Criminal Court and other judiciary bodies and special court which I have been established, established during my time has been working. But unfortunately, we have not seen much progress in this. You mentioned Syria, and there is an intriguing reference in your new book. It says, if the UN had been allowed to take a larger role earlier in the Syrian war, I believe Europe would not now be grappling with their own refugee crisis. What role did you want the UN to take, and who stopped you? I have been speaking to al-Bashar Assad uh, of Syria many times, but he's been lying all the time, so therefore then I appointed uh, my predecessor Kofi Annan, then Lakta Brahimi, and many uh, able, um, <coughs> able uh, diplomats. But all these uh, negotiations have not yielded any, any uh, uh, success, any result. Because of the division among P5, permanent members of the Security Council, that is why many member states are now arguing that there should be reform of the Security Council. But it is, after all, their decision. Decision is in the hands of five permanent members. Therefore, while the reform of the Security Council has been on the agenda many years, many decades now, we have not been able to make any progress. I am really uh, very much uh, frustrated about uh, this kind of a situation. I am urging as a former Secretary General and also uh, my successor, Antonio Guterres, who will be uh, re I mean, reappointed uh, soon, then I think the United Nations should really uh, speak out on the matters of principle human rights and the human dignity. Well, one of those matters is a country that has deteriorated greatly this year in terms of its situation, one where you worked for a very long time, and that's Myanmar, where there was a coup on the 1st of February. You spoke in the Security Council, a powerful call to action in April. You said there was a fleeting moment for strong action to stop the atrocities. Nothing's been done. Do you fear that fleeting moment has now passed? In my report to the Security Council on April 19th, I suggested to the members of the Security Council to consider even the process of uh, invoking responsibility to protect, as we did in 2011 in the case of uh, Libya. Of course, this will be met I'm afraid to say that by the veto power. But if um, there are tools, there are regimes which we can apply to address all this unacceptable situation, but the member states of the United Nations, particularly security, they are not, uh, they are divided, completely divided. And therefore, I'm really urging, first of all, it's an issue among the ASEAN. So ASEAN leaders should take a much, much stronger action. I myself offered my own visit to meet the uh, Myanmar military coup leader, uh, but they replied uh, that the timing was not uh, convenient for them. But when would be, there would be convenient time for me to visit? Because nothing has been happening. It is the people who will suffer from all this uh, military dictatorship. You mention the problems in the Security Council, and again, it comes back to the dysfunction in the permanent five members of the Security Council. With regard to Myanmar, with regard to Tigray and Ethiopia, there seems to be no appetite for any sort of punitive action, arms embargo, sanctions uh, from Russia and China. Potentially, though, as you move forward, if these two countries aren't going to support sanctions, and we know that they're not under UN sanctions, but both countries are under EU and US sanctions, doesn't increasingly the Security Council become more and more toothless, and then the UN itself become more irrelevant? It's not toothless. In fact, uh, it has become toothless um, 
Um, but they have teeth, very strong power and tools uh, to solve the problems, to solve unacceptable uh, human rights issues and violations of um, uh, principles and ideals of the International uh, in United Nations Charter. In the case of Tigray, I'm again uh, deeply concerned that uh, this is now being perpetuated by the country where the leader is a Nobel Peace Laureate. Prime Minister Abi Ahmed was awarded Nobel Peace Laureate just a couple of years ago. Now, this all 6.6 million people in Degray, Degray, I think they are suffering a lot because of, uh, first of all, lack of food, lack of water, and there is always uh, uh, military actions. I am again asking African Union. African Union, they have uh, quite an efficient way of making decisions, uh, but they have not yet taken in a collective way. In recent weeks, we've seen another conflict in the Middle East, the bombardment of Gaza, rockets fired by Hamas. You have seen this before several times when you were the Secretary General. I was in the region recently. I've been visiting for 30 years. I spoke to quite a few Palestinian people, and there's absolutely no hope left among these people. What is to be done? This 11-day war between Israel and Hamas was really terrible. And it reminded me of uh, my time when I had to deal with uh, such kind of um, uh, Israeli bombing, which had been mostly provoked by Hamas all the times. But I know that it, all this had been provoked by Hamas and returned by Israelis. But the magnitude of uh, returning all this crisis was not rational, rational, first of all. It also reminded me of um, my own diplomat diplomatic engagement in January 2009. It started the December, late December 2008, but I was on the road and uh, I was on a so-called um, conveyor belt di diplomacy. I was visiting at least uh, four countries a day, meeting leaders of uh, four countries. Secretary General, should the current Secretary General be doing that because he didn't leave New York? Well, that's uh, his, uh, his job, and I do not have any comment about this. I have been speaking to uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu all the times. Then there is a saying that um, you can have choice of everything as a human being. You can have a choice of your friends, whom to meet or whom to not meet. Even you can have a choice of your own spouse. If you don't like, then each can divorce. But when it comes to geographical labor, you have no choice. You have to live as long as this planet Earth last continues. This is what I have been saying. Therefore, I am urging now next Prime Minister, um, Mr. Bennett seems to be next to Prime Minister of Israel, and he should sit down together with uh, President uh, Mohammed, Mahmoud Abbas, Abbas, Abbas of uh, Palestinian Authority. There are all the agendas on the table. It's a matter of choice. There are many Security Council resolutions, numerous Security Council resolutions, and there is also Oslo Agreement, and there is uh, Abraham Accord. Yeah, but Se Secretary some General, support. sorry, sorry to interrupt yeah. you there. Um, they yeah. all refer yeah. to a two-state solution, but just yeah. the situation on the ground now. Where is the viable Palestinian state? It's already been built all over. Now, Palestinians, of course, uh, they are not uh, solid, solidly uh, unified, um, but. When they are under oppression, under such a hugely difficult um, human situation, it's only natural that they are not united. And then 
Israel, as a bigger and more powerful country, they should be more compassionate. I have declared while visiting Israel, I think I'm the only Secretary General who has been publicly stating that Israel has the, I appreciate the genuine security concern of Israel. That was very much appreciated by Israelis because nobody was speaking out about Israel's own security concern. It's a genuine. So we fully appreciate that kind of genuine. That does not give any right to um, destroy all this uh, settlement and uh, unconditional bombings with much, much super military power. And therefore, they should sit down together. There are many options are already available. And there are many countries who are really willing to support two-state solutions. Now, with all this, um, uh, Israelis having diplomatic relationship with the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Sudan, and Morocco, and the Middle East uh, region, I think this is a good opportunity for Israelis also to be genuinely compassionate and try to resolve this once and for all, for a lasting peace, so that Israelis and Palestinians can live peace in peace and security side by side. As a reporter who covers international affairs and is based at UN headquarters, I witnessed many of the events you did, and I appreciate from reading the book your viewpoint on them. But I'll have to be honest with you, there is one part of the book, one section of the book, I found rather jarring. And that's when you refer to Haiti. Uh, and as you know, there was an earthquake there, and then the UN peacekeepers brought cholera. And yet you say of the court case that was brought uh, against the UN, I thought this lawsuit was fraudulent from the beginning and I was incensed every time I thought about this attempt to extort money from the United Nations. Surely these were just people who had been victims of the United Nations trying to get some justice. United Nations also lost 102 staff and sole peacekeepers. And it was the United Nations, United Nations, under my leadership, who have been genuinely and uh, persistently trying to help um, Haitian people. Unfortunately, hundreds of thousands of people have been contaminated by cholera virus. Yes, and, we and, did and, and just, to, just to interrupt you for a second, you yes. did the right thing and set up a fund for those people, but it's woefully underfunded. No money is going to these victims. So can you not understand why they'd want to take out a court case? My last report to this General Assembly on Haiti was uh, early December of my last month, 2016. And I appealed that uh, we need to uh, mobilize some fundings. Uh, that was not a big, big money, but Member states were not willing to um, show their sincere support for Haitian people. At the same time, Haitian leaders, leadership, they were divided among themselves. That was also one of my source of um, dissatisfaction and regret. That there is a saying that uh, heaven helps those who help themselves, but they were not really united starting from the present. That was what uh, I was very much sorry to witness myself as a Secretary General. Member states have not shown much, um, much support for Haiti. That's one of my regrets. And that is one area that, uh, because of this uh, earthquake and after reconstruction process, United Nations has been blamed um, sometimes in an unfair way. But uh, I'm ready to, to receive that kind of criticism. Your new memoir, looking back on your life's work, is called Resolved. But looking forward, many of the world's conflicts and problems are not resolved. Can I ask you how you see the future? How you see the future world your grandchildren will live in? Are you hopeful? 
when United Nations member states are not solidly unit, united, that is the problem now. Then there is no way for any, however able Secretary General one may be, and then not a single individual or country can do it alone. We should uh, put all our hands on the deck together. Former Secretary General of the United Nations Ban Ki-moon, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shukran Jazeera.